Hi, everyone. I'm super excited to be back here at uh, the Process AI Marketplace and especially pleased for the opportunity to speak with Prashanth uh, on the topic of building technical communities and the opportunities created by data and AI. Uh, as Paul mentioned, I will be monitoring the Q&A panel for your questions and we'll either work them in or we'll have some time at the end. Uh, but I'm really looking forward to this. So let's just dive in. Uh, Prashanth, I imagine that everyone here in our audience has some personal experience with Stack Overflow as a user. Uh, but what can you tell us to help us under understand the scale uh, of what you've built? Yeah, no, thank you, Sam, for, uh, for inviting me here and for moderating the session. Also, congrats to you for building such an amazing community around this space, particularly in, uh, in AI and ML. So it's been amazing to see all that you have accomplished. Uh, so yeah, so Stack Overflow, you know, I think, you know, again, I can't take all the credit for you. So it's really our community and our founders and the team that has sort of, you know, been here for about 13 years. Uh, we were founded in, you know, 2008. I joined as the, you know, as the new CEO in 2019. Uh, and we had, you know, several amazing leaders that have joined uh, since uh, to help us sort of scale to this next level. But the scale at which we operate is massive, right? So we have uh, close to 100 million monthly visitors from around the world, right? There is, you know, no geography that we don't touch, uh, you know, for the most part. Uh, we have something like 50 million questions and answers on every possible technology topic. So, you know, everything from uh, an Amazon Web Services, which has something like 250,000 questions and answers, or, you know, something like even, you know, uh, data science, which is obviously near and dear to this audience, we have something like, you know, 31,000 questions in that sort of space alone, uh, or, you know, any scripting language, programming language, you name it, right? So all that content exists in a very sort of significant uh, way. And that information has been accessed uh, close to 50 billion times since our, in, since our inception. So the impact of what we drive in the industry is massive. Uh, and since we are talking to a data specific audience, uh, just to put that in terms of uh, terabytes, uh, you know, that in terms of, you know, the access public, the public actually acts, has access and all of you in the audience have access to about one terabyte uh, worth of questions and answers and comments that are available for, you know, your own sort of analysis and you know, other things that you can do with that. Uh, but internally, we, we have something close to 70 terabytes of data available for our own internal analysis. So, you know, fairly meaningful scale. And having said all that, I would still say that we're fairly early in that sort of evolution. That hopefully gives you a sense of uh, how large we are and we operate, you know, obviously globally. That's awesome. Awesome. Uh, so beyond the stats and, and figures, what are some surprising things you can tell us about Stack Overflow that, you know, most folks might not realize or know? Yeah, I think most people know us uh, as the public website with all the stats that I just explained. And that's been sort of, you know, what has been you know, driving the impact in the industry for the past 13 years. But most people probably don't know or do not know that we have a very thriving, fast growing SaaS business uh, and a very fast growing advertising focused business. And those are our two business lines. Uh, that have been sort of, you know, thriving throughout the history of the company, but more recently our SaaS transformation, which is one of the reasons I came on board along with the, a few other leaders, um, has really been really exceptional to see, right? That is effectively a private version of our public platform that I explained for enterprises and, and other sort of organizations to use internally to collaborate uh, asynchronously using the same platform that developers and technologists have been enjoying over the past decade or so. So that is, you know, probably the most unknown fact when people go to Stack Overflow through a Google search, land on an answer, they typically get the answer. They're in the workflow of trying to, figure, you know, get unstuck and they're, they're on their way. But typically what now we're beginning to surface uh, more and more that, you know, we have these paid products that are equally uh, useful and value added as a, for a user as they say to, they, they operate within organizations uh, and, and companies. Great, great. Uh, Paul mentioned that you joined in October of 2019, so just about two years ago, and you stepped into the role that was previously held by the company's very well-known founder, uh, Joel Spolsky, um, and, you know, Jeff Atwood as well, like a very strong founder, uh, culture at, at the company. And, um, curious about 
how that transition came about, what the culture of the organization was like, and what were your priorities when you joined? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a huge blessing to have amazing founders, right? Joel Skolsky and uh, Jeff Atwood uh, are 100% credited with, you know, what they've actually built, right? They, along with the community and the stackers that, have, that were here in the first decade of the company, uh, built this amazing community and public platform that, you know, the stats that I mentioned are a product of their sort of very, you know, blood, sweat and tears to be very thoughtful about how to make trade-offs and how to ensure ultimately that the best answer is ultimately delivered to somebody that is stuck in a, you know, in a technical situation. Um, and so what happened was, you know, the company grew, uh, you know, in terms of its, of its impact. And then there was this question of what is the sort of sustainable business model for the company going forward? So there was this sort of uh, existential question, uh, and I, you know, Jeff Atwood had to left the company several years ago uh, as the first founder. So the remaining, the founder, uh, Joel, was the CEO of the company. And through 2019, you know, he, he sort of just, along with the board of the company, which was, you know, all, you know, previously a bunch of the, you know, the fairly prominent venture capital firms like Union Square Ventures and Index Ventures and Spark and Andreessen Horowitz and so on, uh, decided that it was time to bring in some external perspective, somebody who had helped grow a very rapidly, um, you know, scaling organization, uh, especially as we thought about uh, the SaaS business model of the software as a service business model. So, you know, long, and, you know, fast forward a little bit after about 250 uh, interviews with many different people, uh, you know, they, you know, they literally, you know, I think they, they, they did talk to about, they screened about 250 candidates. Uh, they did end up finding me and I was relevant for the role and uh, for in a couple of dimensions. One is, of course, I was a user of Stack. All my teams at Rackspace, as with the introduction was mentioned, use Stack Overflow throughout, you know, so I, so I was obviously very aware of it. My teams were very aware of it. So there's an appreciation for what this community stands for and what it does. And at the same time, uh, my experience, my personal experience of having sort of helped scale uh, the cloud services business at Rackspace to help pivot it from a data center company or managed hosting company to more of a services company on delivering services, cloud services on top of AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud, that, that which became one of the fastest growing businesses at Rackspace, that experience uh, was also relevant here because there's a sort of opportunity with this raw material and this, you know, this diamond in the rough with Stack Overflow, how do we really scale this organization? So those two sort of elements, one, my own sort of, uh, you know, sort of real appreciation for what this community uh, is all about. And secondly, my experience is really ultimately what, uh, you know, brought me here. And since then, you know, we've hired some amazing uh, leaders who you asked, you know, how the transition's been. Uh, beyond, of course, meeting with community members, my, you know, my first year meeting with customers, meeting with stackers, as we call them, our employees. And really, you know, I'm a fairly hands-on person on that, in that regard, you know, I, I think it really is important for leaders, in my opinion, to be, to understand and to have context when making decisions. Um, that gave me perspective, okay, like we have a certain set of things that we need to do here, are the gaps in the organization, the types of new leaders we need to bring in. And very soon I was able to bring in, uh, you know, several very, very capable folks. You know, first, uh, my first hire was the chief product officer and technology officer, Teresa Dietrich, who is connected with this group now, uh, amazing leader who's leading, you know, our product engineering and community efforts in the company. Uh, Tim Miller, our CRO, uh, who is a fantastic uh, revenue uh, leader, who's leading all our sales efforts and customer success efforts and really driving the predictable revenue path. Uh, and then since then, hired several other folks to augment the existing team. So we hired a new chief people officer and a, uh, a new uh, CFO very recently. So all with experience of folks that have been there, done that, and are able to sort of take us to this next stage of the company sort of evolution. So it's a very much a transformation story to get to this sort of end, end game, as I mentioned, with a sustainable recurring revenue sort of business model on top of, of course, uh, a great community. Got it. So you, you're in a unique position of having led teams of rackers and stackers. You got it. Yeah. I, I, my first, I got to say, Sam, my first, uh, you know, month or two, I constantly, you know, sort of mix those terms up. I was like, Hey, rackers. And like, if people are like, Whoa, like where, where did that come from? But it, 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 it does rhyme, but yes. Nice. Nice. Um, and little did you know, after joining six months later, you'd be helping lead the company through an event that uh, affected many lives, many organizations, of course, the, the pandemic. What was the impact of the pandemic uh, on and at Stack Overflow? 
Yeah, on a couple of different dimensions, right? So by the way, I joined October of 2019 and I've been, you know, effectively a remote CEO for probably more than 75% of my time. Now that comes with positives and negatives. So let's just talk about both dimensions of the impact of the company, right? So one is on the positive side, let's start there. Uh, we have, you know, seen a significant uh, increase in the relevance of our company in this moment in time, because you know, what we really enable is to help the world really accelerate development of technology. And that's effectively what our mission is through shared knowledge or, you know, by sharing knowledge with each other. And that has allowed our numbers to really sort of go up. And if you look at the, the, just the overall volume of the number of signups as, as one small proxy, uh, you know, we had, when I joined, about 150,000 monthly signups on our public platform. This today, we see something somewhere between 200 and 250,000 signups per month. You know, again, just remember this is 13 years after we were founded. So not insignificant, it's only going up. Uh, if you look at the number of users, whether they're mostly, you know, people do it somewhat sort of, uh, uh, they're more lurkers than they are sort of contributors. The net net, we still have a lot more users, but we see the number of people on our platform increasing very steadily year over year. So every year we seem to be sort of increasing and we've seen that increase quite uh, be dramatic over the past couple of years since the pandemic. Uh, our, the relevance of our plate products have also skyrocketed. So our Teams product, Stack Overflow for Teams, uh, which I would encourage uh, the folks in the audience, if you haven't checked it out, go sign up for a freemium account and try it out for yourselves and for your, your own teams, uh, which you can do on our website. You know, that is very relevant because it's an asynchronous collaboration tool that sits alongside synchronous collaboration tools like Slack and Microsoft Teams. You can just you know, run an organization or, or collaborate with each other with just synchronous tools because it's extremely, uh, you know, uh, debilitating for technologists because it's a lot of context switching and, you know, it's prone for people are prone to burnout and those scenarios will be constantly being pinged. You know, while we've been on this conversation, Sam, if I look at my, in my Slack window, I've got about seven, <laughs> seven things, right? And what if rather than me having to wait an hour to respond to them, what if Stack Overflow for Teams has already responded automatically through the Slack integration that we have by suggesting questions and answers that have already been documented through our system. So that's the product that we have, Stack Overflow for Teams, as is one small example. But the point is that that product's relevance in the context of remote work and hybrid work has gone up, you know, very significantly. So we're very much in big enterprises making the case for why they should use our product. And then our advertising business reach and relevance has also sort of increased because people want quality places to showcase their products that are helping with acceleration of technology development and you know, all the other buzzwords like digital transformation. But the idea is that we are the place. We are the place where the communities for technologists exist. And that's why it's so powerful. So that's all the good stuff, right? And maybe one of the good stuff, I'd, one other good point I'd mention is that we've been really able to expand uh, the locations of where we are hiring people from. So for example, all the leaders I mentioned to you, a bulk of them have come from California. You know, we were known as a New York-based startup, but we've been really able to, to really expand our aperture on the types of people we hire. So those are all, you know, positive things. Now, the negative things about what's happened is that it's taken a personal toll to the, as you mentioned, uh, you know, to people all around the world. And, you know, I think a lot of different issues have sort of come to the surface uh, around the world that we've had to sort of navigate as a company and to support our stackers uh, to make sure they feel supported. Uh, so this is everything from, you know, personal health issues to families that are affected to, you know, racial bias to, you know, all of this is sort of all has sort of, you know, uh, uh, come together. And that's been a very challenging time. And, you know, 2020 was absolutely challenging. And, you know, we even had to sort of make certain pivots in our own company where we moved away from certain products, a particular product, our talent product that was focused on job listings. We moved away from it because we just felt like that was a very sort of boom or bust type of product, which is, you know, if people are hiring, you hire. If people are not, you don't. And it was also somewhat disparate from our overall strategy. So, and that had some people implications, which is unfortunate always. But the point being that it was, you know, there's plenty of uh, things that, you know, were also so we had to navigate that were negative. But overall, though, I think we're better for it. We're stronger as a company. We're more, we've, you know, we've zoned in on what we are as a company. And, you know, that's helped. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So one more transition I want to ask you about, and that is the acquisition by Process. Uh, how did that come to be? Yeah, you know, it's, it's somewhat organic. I think, you know, ultimately what, you know, really brought us together uh, was that Process's mission statement is very, very aligned with what we care about, right? So I, if I'm saying that mission correctly, it's like, you know, Process builds leading 
consumer internet companies and empower people and enrich communities. When you think about that statement, that, that speaks immediately to the heart and soul of this company. And that's what's so exciting about, uh, you know, really sort of working with process. And for us, it's, you know, we were thinking about, it wasn't something that we sought out. It was something that sort of, like I mentioned, organic. It just sort of happened with a sort of a series of events. Uh, but we've always been approached by companies throughout our history, right? And the question was around, who was somebody that we could sort of partner with for the long term? Who could help think big and really understood the potential of this company and the ability to go 10x uh, relative to where we are today and this, this diamond in the rough type of approach? Uh, and really, who has an international and global perspective that matches the global community that we have, which is literally from all around the world, right? Uh, and then this ed tech angle, uh, which, you know, with Larry uh, Ill, who's the CEO of the ed tech portfolio, uh, was a very interesting uh, element for us because if you think about what we do, we implicitly allow people to learn, you know, technologists uh, and, and developers to learn. And the edtech angle is very exciting because learning does start with a question, generally speaking. You know, people really, that's how you typically learn versus just going, you know, with more traditional ways. And so this huge focus on community, emerging markets, international orientation and edtech were the reasons why we ultimately saw that this is really, you know, I think a powerful combination for us just to work in a long-term sense, but by thinking really big. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And kind of on that point of community, um, you know, let's transition from the transition questions and talk a little bit about how the company thinks about uh, community and collaboration and enabling these things at the, the scale at which you operate. Yeah, so I mean, ultimately, like I've mentioned, uh, Sam, I think you know, hybrid workforces are here to stay, right? And so I think that is not going away anytime, even if the pandemic disappears. I think there's so many studies now done that employees really, really appreciate the flexibility uh, of, you know, being able to sort of reduce that commute hours from, you know, two hours to, you know, zero. Uh, and also be ha having the flexibility for them to sort of have a little bit more control about, you know, their balance and their work life and so on. So I think, but at the same time, there's a very important, uh, you know, kind of, uh, it's important to understand the impact of synchronous uh, communication and collaboration uh, versus sort of asynchronous collaboration. And so it's important as we sort of balance out things like burnout, et cetera. So ultimately, you know, when we think about how do we scale, uh, you know, this community, I think a lot of it has to do with making sure that, um, you know, we are solving very specific uh, problems to empower team members to share knowledge, you know, both proactively and reactively. And, you know, most of the sort of knowledge management tools that sort of exist today solve one or the other. I mean, the keys and file storage are focused on more like proactive knowledge sharing. Uh, and so information is likely lacking and there's often, you know, there's always, uh, they sort of offer no real way to foster collaboration and things like email and chat are very sort of instantaneous. So we believe that uh, you know, and there's too much reliance on one person. So we really, we really believe that it's an opportunity to build communities through our products and our public community, um, which is sort of a fundamental way in which we can do that. Um, and so that's, you know, I think ultimately these communities, when we think about the kind of the focus of how we want to scale, we think about it as the external community and we talk about internal communities and the external communities is public platform and the public community. And then these internal community communities is through Stack Overflow for Teams. And then we also have something in between that we call collectives on Stack Overflow, which is sort of in between, it's a sort of a pseudo public, pseudo private space on Stack Overflow where companies like technology companies like a Google or a GitLab, et cetera, or even open source communities like Golang or GoLanguage uh, can uh, build their communities on top of Stack Overflow and a little bit of a walled garden so they can have a sort of a, a, sort of a very sort of a, uh, hyper-focused space on their technologies to engage with their power users and so on. So we really believe, and as, you know, Teresa, our uh, chief product officer would say, you know, creating sort of this sort of link between public and private and having sort of the, the pebbles between those sort of, uh, those sort of, you know, in the, in the valley, so to speak, is sort of how we are approaching scaling out these products. And all three of them are very relevant, you know, it's public community, hybrid, as well as uh, private. And so what, uh, what's the relationship between Stack Overflow, the company and the various communities that you steward? Is it uh, a very hands-on one? Um, is it very distributed? How, what's the governance model? How do you, how do you think about 
all of the kind of management challenges that come along with growing communities? Yeah, I think, you know, so ultimately, my, you know, we have a few principles that we operate uh, with to make sure that we are managing our relationship uh, with the community uh, in a productive way. So ultimately, I'll just give you our overall principles, right? When we think about communities, and I've, I've spoken about the subject a few times, is one is we want to focus on a shared identity, a really big problem that everybody wants to work on together. And we have that here with, with Stack. Secondly, to create sort of sufficient incentives for people to contribute and participate in that system. And in our case, it's about, you know, really helping out your fellow developer. It's about showcasing your knowledge as the best Python programmer in the world, being recognized for it and so on. Um, thirdly, it's about building with the community versus for the community. And that's important because, you know, you, as a company, you can't just sort of impose a bunch of rules in, uh, into a very large group of people and say, just follow this, because that's not really inclusive. Plus, it's not really, not really, not really going to have the buy-in to be able to do it. So it's a more common sense when you're trying to really operate at the scale to really have them as equal partners, then meaning the broader public community, and you need representation to be able to do that. And it's a very, very sort of, uh, you know, sort of uh, closely sort of, uh, and sort of thoughtfully sort of uh, managed sort of process to make sure that they feel very included. And fourth, it's about breaking down silos and making sure we build bridges across, you know, these various uh, communities. And we're doing that with those, uh, those products that I mentioned to you. And then ultimately that creates all these virtuous cycles uh, across these various paid products and these public, uh, the public platforms. So specifically as it relates to community uh, and how we engage with them, there are many different mechanisms. You know, we've hired a really strong VP of community, uh, formerly at Reddit, uh, Philippe uh, Baudet, who is uh, who really manages now that entire effort, who is, who is fantastic. And uh, the idea is for us to partner hand in hand through our moderator mechanisms, through by listening to the community. And there are multiple mechanisms to do that. We have the meta user base. We have our loop newsletter that we send out. And so we're constantly making sure that um, we are partnering very deeply with users to make sure they're they feel as much of a vested interest when we make changes on the website. So it is a, it is definitely a navigation. It's not, it's easier said than done. Uh, it takes up quite a bit of effort and, and, and on, on our team's part. Uh, and that's very unique about this company, but it is very possible because we have a very passionate group of people that care about this big problem that we're going to solve. Mm -hmm. and, and do you see those uh, challenges that you've referenced as being unique to technical communities or is it, um, you know, they comment across all different types of communities. Yeah, it's a good question. I think they're just different, right? I mean, it's like everybody has their own problems. I think that it, or challenges to sort of overcome. Uh, the good news is that we're not a social network, right? Even though we have collaboration at the heart of what we do, social networks have their own set of issues. At least for us, we're dealing with very objective information and it's not subjective in for the most part, right? It's like technical information is either you have, the, you have the right answer on how to solve a problem and you have an incorrect answer. And that could sometimes come across as harsh, Sam, to be candid, right? Because it is, it is very sort of, it's right or wrong. And I think that we are also kind of trying to focus on that effort is to make sure how do, we, how do people have more of a sort of softer landing spot so they get used to this sort of very right or wrong type of approach on the platform. And again, let's not forget that, that that approach has lasted for 13 years. You know, many companies have existed and, and died over the past decade during that time, but there are always trade-offs that you have to make. So, so this community of technical folks, yes, they can be, you know, I think they can be, they, you know, I think as all technical folks are, like we're all technical folks, we can be skeptical about a particular approach because it's always, a, you know, an engineering answer that may be better or, you know, and so on. Uh, but that, that skepticism ultimately generates the right answer. And that's what people appreciate because they're able to solve their problem when they, ha when they have an issue. Right. And that's, what's powerful about it. Mm -hmm. uh, let's transition to talking a little bit about, uh, data and AI at Stack Overflow. Um, just to kind of start things off, you know, where would you characterize Stack Overflow as being in its AI journey? Yeah, I would characterize it as fairly, uh, fairly nascent, like, you know, and fairly early in our evolution. Now, having said that, I will say that, you know, uh, uh, Teresa, our chief people officer, and, you know, and on her team, she has now hired uh, Michael Forey, who is just an excellent, uh, you know, uh, data platform leader that he just came on board from Capital One. And so we've made a very deliberate 
uh, decision to sort of invest in this space because, you know, again, like I mentioned at the top of the, this conversation, you know, we have a tremendous amount of data that we, that we have, right? That's the, you know, the, the one terabyte of data that's available for the public to use and the 70 terabytes that we ultimately have on all sorts of dimensions. So, the, so we are very much the goal, um, you know, and I've spent some time with both Teresa and Michael, is that we want to empower people in the company and ultimately our community and our customers to be able to really sort of self-serve and make the most of the, accident of the data that we have, which is amazing, right? Once a year, we do a survey uh, which polls about 100,000 people. This past year was 85,000 people to talk about developer trends, right? And that's our Stack Overflow developer survey that comes out every year. And that's great. It has a lot of great insights, but it's a very discreet once a year type of effort. Why not enable people, whether that's employees or beyond, to have that sort of insight on a regular on-demand basis? That, that'd be very powerful for us to do. And so where we are is we were very early in establishing sort of the phases of rollout. And, you know, we're, you know, we're very much in the process of determining, you know, establishing just, you know, all the things that you expect, right? A data lake and a training regime. Uh, we're evaluating things like Azure blob storage and, you know, Snowflake and Databricks uh, and even sort of some abstracting tools like Data Robot uh, and all these sort of, uh, that evaluation is happening very, very sort of at an early level. Uh, beyond that, of course, phase two will all be about building out an actual data team with, you know, actual data scientists. And then ultimately, of course, would be things like optimizing for latency and internal runtime. So we're fairly early in that journey, Sam, despite all the data that we collect. And the team uh, so far over the past several years has done a lot of things uh, despite not having all those sort of best-in-class type of things in place, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and one small example of this is we even built something called the unfriendly robot, our data science, data team did, by going and by building a very fairly early stage AI ML type of capability that basically goes and scans out all our stack overflow stack exchange websites and flags where there are somewhat, you know, untasteful comments uh, to a question. Uh, and so that is important to us again for, you know, for novice users, et cetera, so they have a, a good experience. So that is one example of how, you know, despite not having the full foundation built out, we are still able to do powerful things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've talked a bit about the the main data set, this text data set that you have. Are there other data sets uh, that uh, you think are are potentially interesting for the company? Yeah, I think, you know, the, the, the data that we collect is, um, is, you know, it's quite, it's quite robust and has this, you know, there's so much opportunity to sort of analyze it, right? If you think about what we're collecting, we do collect structured data like, uh, you know, users and, you know, you know, it's kind of like, you know, all those sort of things, our pros and who's logged in and, you know, when they logged in and so on and so forth, the number of questions that are asked and answered and so on. But the vast majority of what we do collect is unstructured. So, you know, free form text in our questions and answers and comments and tags and, you know, sort of the obvious examples. Uh, we also have things like network graphs where we are able to almost like, you know, if you think about like this sort of fluorescent liquid that goes and tracks exactly what happens when somebody experiences stack, you know, a user searched for a particular item, they looked at then question one, question two, they copied code from question three, then they posted another question, you know, X minutes later. So like all that is very, very, um, you know, that's powerful. So I think that's sort of, and then of course we have code snippets beyond just text data. So there's, there's a lot that we capture that, uh, and the commentary and the uploads and downloads and, you know, all that is great context and gives a really sort of good uh, sense of the why. Like, why are people actually doing what they're doing? And that's very rich for us to be able to sort of go and analyze. Um, and so that's that's what's exciting. Nice, nice. Uh, you mentioned the uh, the unfriendly bots. Um, yeah. Are you, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that project and kind of how it evolved, how it's used, that kind of thing? Yeah, you know, we should, we should uh, have uh, Michael Foray do a, a deep dive on it. But I would say, you know, ultimately it, it basically leverages machine learning to scan our public platform uh, for unfriendly comments and the, the sort of, that can be sort of addressed and eliminated, right? So it's, it's sort of a, it's a fairly early stage um, uh, sort of um, effort by us to make sure that our our platform is welcoming to the next generation of coders. So one of the criticisms of Stack is that, hey, as a new, as a new user, it's quite harsh of an environment because you know, I'm asking a very simple question and I got shot down by somebody on the platform because they thought it was not a great question. 
And the answer is that, you know, that, that system has existed and to make sure that the right answer and the right questions are asked, the quality of information is very high. And that was a trade-off that was made as part of the principle of setting up the platform. But how, but this friendly robot is mostly, it's there to sort of improve the experience of the average user, the novice user. At the same time, we are evaluating other softer landing zones, like, you know, a place where people can just sort of get guidance and kind of onboard a lot more sort of in a friendly environment and try out a few things before they actually go and ask their first question. So they don't feel you know, like the harsh experience. So it gives us a, an ability to address the issue, perhaps in some cases addressing the symptom, in some cases addressing, uh, you know, sort of more of a short-term fix. So that's, that hopefully gives you a little bit more context on what we're trying to do there. Got it. Got it. And earlier you mentioned uh, in the context of the team's product integration with Slack and the product being able to suggest answers, is that also a, kind of an ML powered bot? Uh, yes, in, in that also, so with Teams as an example, you know, we, uh, our capability is very powerful in a couple of dimensions. So one is, you know, when people search for a question, they can do that on Stack Overflow for Teams. They can, we have, and by the way, we have companies like Microsoft and Bloomberg and Extensify and you name it, right? All big, big enterprises and, and, and high growth startups that are using our product. Microsoft has over 100,000 users on Stack Overflow for Teams. So it's a fantastic tool uh, and capable of product for enterprises to, to use uh, to collaborate asynchronously. Now, as far, why it works so well is, you know, it is, if somebody asks a question, how do I do this on AWS within a company or within Microsoft apps are asking, how do I do this on Microsoft Azure? You know, the question is, go, even when they ask that within MS Teams, uh, which is integrated with Stack Overflow for Teams, uh, it's going to prompt the user with three other questions that sound similar. Hey, like your colleague asked this question already, you know what I mean? And so don't ask another question to just add to the, add to the noise. Go look at the answer that was documented six months ago by somebody else. And you're a brand new employee to Microsoft. Go check this question out, you know, or when the new employee comes in, it, they're getting a package of 50 questions and answers and a bunch of long form articles, as we call them, long form content uh, called articles that gives them, and how do you onboard into Microsoft Azure at Microsoft as an example, right? Or, yeah. or how do you use a tool and so on? So those prompts and, you know, uh, is another example of how ML is fueling question prompts. Say, listen, you know, here's another question that may be similar to what you're asking and so on. So we are, we are slowly incorporating those sort of features. One other point I'd mentioned to you is, um, you know, our search capability, there's a lot that we could do there because again, we have access to just a ton of information. We launched something called Unified Search uh, this past year where uh, somebody asking a question, again, that we're using that Microsoft example, how do I do some Microsoft Azure? They could get five answers from the public community that is relevant, that we have about 250,000 questions on Microsoft Azure in the public community on Stack Overflow. And then it would also present maybe three answers from just a private, just within Microsoft, something that's specific, that is confidential to Microsoft that's also presented as part of that answer set. So you're getting sort of this robust private and public combination. So I, I can we can imagine there's a lot more to do there with, uh, with ML and AI. Got it, got it. Yeah. What folks in our audience most want to know is what do you see as the single most impactful potential use case for AI at Stack Overflow? Wow, okay, I think this is a, this, it's a powerful question. I think that for us, the amount of data that we collect across the organization, the data that we have access to, and uh, all we, we know about a trend before a trend is actually formalized, you know. And so we don't really fully sort of, um, a pre, uh, we don't really sort of realize that in the context of sharing that information with all the relevant people. So I think there's, for example, I mentioned previously, doing a once a year developer survey to then sort of figure out that in what spelt is the top language uh, that made its way to the top of the list this year is not like, you know, it's not, a, it's, yes, it's a discrete moment in time that we're calculating that, but for people to know about all the ways in which technology is changing and technology is changing very rapidly. The, the reason why we have so much innovation on new scripting languages and, and, and programming languages, languages is that, you know, there are inefficiencies with each one, you know, constantly optimizing for some set of variables and they will, that will always continue to exist, right? So you had VMs in the early days, now you have serverless and you have, you know, even beyond that, right? So the point is that it's a continuous evolution. And I think the ability to empower developers and technologists and people that are in the detail on a daily basis to say, there is a better way to do this, uh, you know, or you know what, that answer may be outdated. And, you know, we, here's a more relevant answer. 
all those things, I think, are capabilities that our AI ML uh, tool set in the future could help uh, power and give people insight a lot earlier. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, on the topic of trends in the survey, are there particularly interesting or surprising trends that have popped up uh, as you've done the survey over the past couple of years? Yeah, I think, you know, some of the, some of the trends are interesting, uh, especially as it relates to sort of the future of work and how people sort of, um, you know, how, what people appreciate going forward versus previously. I think, I think 70% of developers, uh, based on a survey are learning a new technology at least once a year, which is, you know, fascinating to us, which is like, wow, this, this you know, this is ultimately sort of a learning engineers would love to learn. We know that. But we didn't realize 70% of developers do that, which is like a very high number. You know, 60% of these developers are learning to code from online resources, which is, you know, kind of a, a hat tip to process in the ed tech portfolio and ultimately what our role in that. And ultimately, I think people also really want to make sure that they, uh, you know, have the flexibility. I don't have the exact stat. But, you know, in terms of like their ability to have a hybrid work environment, the ability to have flexibility in their work, you know, there's this brand resignation that you're hearing about, you know, in the industry. And a lot of that um, is being perhaps is, you know, people are making choices based on, you know, do they, first of all, are they working for mission driven, mission driven organizations that they, they respect and they care about the mission? And secondly, do they have control in this sort of world that seems to reduce people's uncertainty? they have more control over their sort of, you know, their, their professional lives. And I think that having the flexibility uh, and hybrid work, et cetera, is sort of another sort of very interesting spike that we've seen in, in our surveys. Nice. Um, we've recently seen some interesting evolution in the industry kind of around AI-based code generation, like OpenAI and GitHub collaborated on a tool called Copilot. Yep. Um, you know, there are, you know, what do you think about the, you know, the future of code generation or those kinds of AI models and Stack Overflow's potential role in that kind of thing? Yeah, I think that, you know, there, there's a lot of potential with those, uh, those elements, right? And so Copilot's an interesting thing. You know, it uh, obviously uses a lot of data uh, in the public sphere as it sort of is able to sort of recommend uh, pieces of code. Uh, it doesn't come, but, you know, it's early days is what I would sort of say, right? There's always uh, enough, you know, we've all read the feedback on, you know, perhaps it sort of is not accurate enough for its propagating errors. And, you know, those are the sort of downsides, but I'm very sort of uh, positive about the direction in that people are constantly looking to automate. It's no different from what I mentioned previously. There's always this thing of how do you improve efficiency? How do you remove context switching, right? And for developers, that's important. And if you can sort of spoon feed as much of sort of the fundam foundation as possible, that's pretty powerful. Uh, but also it comes with downsides. You can't just blindly sort of assume what you're, what, what's being generated is going to work because then you just, you've got a bunch of code that you just don't understand uh, and that may have unintended consequences. So there's a lot more, I think, work to do around uh, training those models, increasing the accuracy, making sure the unintended consequences are less, keeping things like diversity, you know, through in, in design, sort of in mind, uh, you know, and all those sort of elements. It's, it's a multi, it's a very complex problem. And I think in general, I think it's a good move because you obviously constantly want to automate and, you know, we're optimistic and we, we believe we can play a bigger role with that as well because of the amount of data and the richness of the data that we have. And that's very much our stack for for Teams product is meant to do that in many ways, to suggest the right, right answers at the right time to people to get unstuck ultimately, right? In any issue. Yeah. 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 Having played a bit with Copilot, um, at least in its current state, I'd almost rather have some automatic integration between Stack Overflow and the IDE that just tells me go. all the times that the uh, the mistake I'm about to make has been made and what the solution is. Yeah, indeed. You know, that gives you more control. And uh, definitely we have... Uh, we're in the process of thinking through our roadmap for 2022 and uh, IDEs have sort of come up a few times, integrations with IDEs. And so I'll take that back to our product team. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Uh, and so maybe to wrap things up, um, tell us a little bit about the kind of, you know, future state of a, a Stack Overflow, an MLAI enabled Stack Overflow in the context of this process acquisition, like what's possible kind of given where we are today and what your 
looking at with the business? Yeah, so I think that, you know, ultimately, like I mentioned, we have Stack Overflow, the public platform is this massive platform that's accessed by 100 million people. We have Stack Overflow for Teams, that is the private version of that public platform that helps organizations like Microsoft and Bloomberg and so on really have, uh, you know, asynchronous collaboration, increase efficiency and to build faster. And then we have our advertising business, which is, uh, you know, which is called Reach and Relevance which has things like employee branding and collectives on Stack Overflow and so on. So ultimately with something like Teams, we want to, we're in the community building business. That's what we do, right? So we are making sure that Teams is sort of the de facto asynchronous collaboration technology for technologists and knowledge workers from all around the world. Uh, we have a very US centric customer base in Teams today. And with our partnership with Process, we expect it to really sort of expand internationally to replicate that. So you'll see us do that on the Buddha market side uh, in the coming year and years. Uh, so that is, that's one sort of big element of it. Uh, secondly, you know, we want to get even more deeply integrated into the technologist sort of workflow as an extension of the public stack overflow experience. So we know that every developer goes to stack overflow, let's say for the most part. So the question is like, how do we create connective tissue between that public platform experience and the private product, uh, to make sure that that ecosystem of products is like one, right? Cause that is a, that is a that's a core product or a must-have product that nobody can live without. And so you will see us do a lot more building that connective tissue between the public platform, products like collectives, which sits sort of in between, as I mentioned, allowing companies to build their, their communities on Stack Overflow, and then Stack Overflow for teams and private organizations. And then ultimately, you know, it's all about, again, making sure that you know, we're building very thriving communities. So you know, building knowledge and resources that are resilient and evergreen and capturing questions and summing up answers in the flow of communication uh, through these sort of other synchronous tools like Slack and Microsoft Teams to prevent any sort of context switching and really enabling distributed teams uh, to share and recognize and, and really sort of enable this rapid learning uh, for people within organizations in an increasingly sort of distributed sort of world of working into a remote sort of environment. Um, and so really ultimately we want to be able to create sort of this culture of learning so that teams can upscale and scale and, and really sort of do that very quickly uh, for the future of humanity. So that's the, that's where we're going. Awesome. Well, Prashant, uh, thanks so much. It was wonderful chatting with you. Thank you, Sam.